Excellent. So I have the, the pleasure of being end of day, standing between all of you and fun. <laughs> so hopefully we'll keep this lighthearted. Um, is fun? <laughs> maybe it is. Um, I'm Dave Votel. I work for Neo4j, I'm a sales engineering manager based in Vermont. It's uh, one of my dogs here. Um, so I'm traditionally working with our East Coast customers. Um, you can find me online, my code samples on GitHub, LinkedIn here. And outside of Neo4j, I'm an OpenBSD developer, so after hours, if you want to talk operating system junk, feel free to stop by. Um, but today, we're really here to talk about speed. You know, that's really the focus of my talk. Um, and what does fast mean to you? Because I get a lot of people asking about benchmarks and wanting to see performance, and these are always relative concepts. And where I really came from in kind of approaching this conversation with Aero is comparing between the different implementations of Neo4j drivers. So given a use case that's common in data science, I need to move a very large amount of feature vectors out of the graph into an ML platform like Vertex AI or SageMaker or whatnot. You need to push data. So in this case, these are numbers from moving just about 2 million, 256 degree embedding vectors. So they're a couple kilobytes each in size, if you don't know what they end up looking like. And the most important thing is this is a log scale chart showing orders of magnitude improvement over things like the Python driver or the Java driver. So this is really, you know, how, how did we get here? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the behind the scenes of the keynote demo this morning, how that was put together and why it's as fast as it was. And to be honest, you know, this was, the, these capabilities were mostly born out of frustration, at least from my point of view. You know, it was a use case of, um, I had a customer who wanted to move hundreds of millions of feature vectors, and they wanted to do it very quickly. And they wanted to do it every day. And it just wasn't working out with, I got this stupid little pop-up thing from PowerPoint, there we go, with the Python driver. And so, you know, if you want to read my original rant and manifesto, feel free to scan that QR code. It'll take you to the website on GitHub. Um, but I really want to understand why this was problematic and why this wasn't working for them. So I profiled the Python driver. You know, Python's got some good profilers nowadays. And all I did was just use Python, Neo4j Python driver, try to move the vectors out of Neo4j graph data science at scale. And if you've ever seen a flame chart profiling an application, this is probably not what you want to see in any profiler output. So flame graph, rather. And if you look at, yeah, this is line 605 in the packstream.py um, from that version of the code I profiled. And what it's doing is basically iterating over the data coming off the wire and having to unpack it and load it into the Python runtime. So if you're a Python developer or you've worked with Python developers, you've probably heard them complain about something called the GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock. It's what makes Python kind of stable and, you know, in some people's eyes, slow because you can't multi-thread because whoever's mutating a Python object has to hold the Global Interpreter Lock. So what that means is if you're trying to take something off the wire and turn it into a Python object, so like a Python list, you need the lock. So there's no way to parallelize this. Plus, it's extremely CPU bound. As you can see from like, you can read this entire path, that's how wide it is. And on the very, very far right, there is more code that's executing, which you see doesn't take very long over in the blink of an eye. Um, but back to that relative point, I came up with an idea to kind of help us convey to each other, to customers, prospects, friends and family, you know, what, where do you measure kind of the concept of fast from? So. I mean, I've been around a while. I was at some companies that we would always have to talk about like real-time speed. And real-time is always relative to whoever's got the stopwatch and what their objective is. And so I kind of broke it out into these five categories, kind of ordered hierarchically based off of the length of the time, the duration. And it's okay to be in these different areas if you, you know, that's your expectation or that's what you're looking for or you really don't care about moving up one. But I mean, ultimately, Everybody wants real time. They want instant feedback, gratification, keep scrolling, keep clicking, whatever. Batch, you know, batch really makes the world go round. 
It's what really powers most things these days. But when it's down to this level, when you're about to kick off a job or something and you don't know how long it's going to take, you know, you're, you're not going to be happy. And this, this is really where we were with our integration with the Python driver, for instance. Um, really, any driver. It's not driver specific, but there just was no convenient way to migrate a large data set, especially feature vectors, out of Neo4j and into the ecosystem around it. But as of this morning, this is really where we are. This is where we want to be. You know, is this fast enough to use in a REPL, like in the notebook in the demonstration? You know, can I kick this thing off? Do I know if I've just got five minutes to go walk down the hall and get more coffee and come back and expect it to be done? Like really changing the name of the game in how people interact with Neo4j, what their expectations are. And I'm, I'm talking mostly from like a human being point of view because back here, you know, batch oriented with machines, sure, maybe it's compute time you're worried about. Um, so I guess from the machine point of view, if you're paying for compute or you know, basically there's a dollar amount tied to some sort of time dimension, this is cost savings effectively. So how, do, how does this all work? Um, what's you know, well, the secret sauce, I guess, if you will? I mean, ultimately, because names are hard and we have so many conflicting names, there's yet another thing with Arrow in it. I don't know if you went to the arrows.app talk. But we're talking about Apache Arrow, which historically, I believe, um, we'll get into a little bit of the background um, in the next slide. But the way to look at Arrow is it's all around vectorized data. And so from an analogy standpoint, if you're familiar with Apache Avro, Arrow is to vectors as Avro is to rows. Um, and if you need to move a lot of homogeneous data sets, so when you're dumping out hundreds of millions of feature vectors, these are all fixed length arrays of the same data type. You, you should be able to just move it in bulk from one point to another. Vectors are great for that. Plus, just on the flip side, with like the Apache Arrow project being around a while, there's already built-in capabilities to do translation of different serialized formats. So you can put your vectors into Parquet very easily, take them back out. Orc, although I've never used Orc. Even CSV and JSON, if you want to lose a little fidelity in the schema and everything. Uh, but then also some native support to read from certain sources. And then the real kicker is really the first class citizen approach of PyArrow that gives you effectively just like a nice interop with Pandas, Pandas Data Frame API, and NumPy. And so Arrow came out of, I believe, I mean, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows for sure. I think a lot of the code base came out of Apache Drill. Um, and so like the Java implementation actually historically looks very different than the others. So it's all fundamentally written in C++ under the covers. And then there's wrappers in other languages. But for some reason, the Java implementation is its a totally different beast. And I don't understand it. Um, but the real beauty of Arrow is the newer edition called Arrow Flight, which is basically an RPC wrapper around the Arrow concept. Because at the core, Arrow is really all about just data structuring. So how do I take my vectors with a schema pack them together into some buffers, and represent them. They don't necessarily have to be in motion. I, mean, I think it was originally designed to have better zero copy ways to work with data at scale. Um, but then it's a nice natural fit for, OK, now you've got this nice packed serialized format. Let's just move these blocks of data around from point A to point B. And that's where flight comes into play. And so each vector is really comprised of multiple buffers. If you're not going to hack on the arrow code base, you probably don't care or know about this stuff, um, or if you're not going to implement it yourself. But the way to look at it is it's really, it's more than just a single chunk of data. It's actually multiple chunks. So you have potentially a buffer that represents, um, basically it's a bitmap of maybe the nulls in the data. So you could have a sparse data set. So it's intelligent enough not to just move a bunch of bytes that are placeholders for nulls. Um, offsets into complex objects like lists and arrays and then the actual values themselves packed efficiently. So the examples I've got coming up are from the actual Arrow documentation as of last year, December timeframe, when I pulled them. Uh, but I think they're still accurate. So if you wanted to take just a single array of uh, nullable 32-bit integers, signed or unsigned, doesn't matter. You have just basic, like if we just consider it Python for now, just Python list, although there's no null, but I guess you'd have you know, none or something in there. 
you've got one null, two, four, and eight. The way that it ends up represented in arrow under the covers is two different buffers. So it's not just a fixed uh, length array of those values. You've got your validity bitmap that says which, va uh, which values in the vector are populated. So which ones are null versus not null. And then the actual values themselves uh, in the value buffer. So you might transmit some sparse um, information here, but you can very quickly and efficiently understand you know, where are the gaps in some of the data sets here. Um, but Arrow can also do complex objects as well. So it's not just scalars or simple lists of scalars. You could do nested lists of lists. If you're on the Arrow user mailing list, um, somebody was asking a question a couple weeks ago about integrating it with GraphQL and moving JSON objects back and forth, which you can do. I, they claim to have success with that. I don't know why you would do that. Um, but so if you have something like this, nice and complex, you know, nullable list of lists effectively. It's very similar to the previous one, which is scalars, but now you've got the offset buffer. And so as this gets more and more complex, you end up with multiple buffers. And Arrow's job under the covers is to abstract all of this away from you as the developer using the vectors. So like, you don't need to care about all this stuff. This is just how it works on the covers and why it's more efficient than some things. But I do have a very simple demonstration. I haven't practiced with anybody, but it's the end of the day. And I have prizes. I'm from Vermont. I have pure maple candy. <laughs> I bought it in the airport in Burlington. If I have two volunteers who are willing to try this, it'll take 30 seconds tops, maybe even 10. You got one. You get, you get first choice. Pick a deck and don't open it yet. Okay. You want the other one? Perfect. So each deck represents either the protocol we use currently in our drivers or the protocol used in AeroFlight. And so you can take the cards out. You're just going to be a little bit more gentle. And so yours comes with a schema. <laughs> and it's vectorized. You ended up with the deck that represents the state of the art with uh, the Bolt protocol. And now I'm going to ask each of you to take out just the clubs, operating one card at a time as if you're the driver code. <laughs> and pass all the clubs to somebody at your table and let me know when you're done. Whoever finishes first gets the candy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. We got a winner. That was easy. Why was that easy? <laughs> it was packed in a vector, and it had a schema, so you could just quickly skip over whatever was in a club. And if anyone wants to keep the cards, feel free. I mean, I didn't do anything to them. <laughs> now you're the flame graph. You're the one who's uh, taking forever. And so is this it's a magic bullet? No. I mean, Arrow's great for doing what we just did, but the assumption we just had was the data ahead of time, we know the schema. You know exactly what the shape of the stuff is. It's schema on right. If I handed you a deck of cards, I'm assuming you would assume it's a normal deck of cards, but maybe it was, what's that card game where like this cards are weird? Like, it's normal cards, but they're only in certain ranges. Um, I can't remember the name of it. But you, know, you don't see what the card is until you flip it over, which you know, that could be a valid interaction model with the database. That's effectively how Cypher works today with our drivers. It's a schema on read. So you don't have any guarantee that row two, you know, if we think in rows, looks anything like row one. You know, with our properties in the label property graph, it's totally valid and OK to store mixed data types in the same property name. So one, you know, it could just be a data quality issue. You could have a string representation of a date. You could have the actual date time representation on that same property in a different node. And until you read it, you have no idea. So Arrow really kind of does the inverse and says, you need to know the scheme up front, because that's how I'm going to pack this stuff efficiently and how I'm going to move it. So how does this all come together? How did the keynote demo work under the covers? How do we take this, this format and this efficiency and actually put it into practice? So I've got three kind of overviews, the first one being the keynote demo. Um, and then just very small snippets of code for using it with Apache Spark and also with Apache Beam. Because if you have a workflow where basically, let's say it's kind of, you have to onboard data into the graph and then maybe take data out at scale. You know, this is kind of what these are mimicking. So 
the keynote demo, which all the code is provided, the QR code's on the next screen, but I know Philip shared it in the, the keynote this morning. It's really three simple pieces. It's as streamlined as possible to fit it into the you know, six minute deadline for the demo. It's BigQuery, which I didn't have to do anything other than put data in it. Um, some Python code in the middle running in a Jupyter kernel, and then the O4J sitting on a virtual machine. And so it's using Arrow from end to end. So BigQuery has a storage API where you can read native Arrow vectors, which is really cool. So we literally are just taking the data from BigQuery as it gives it to us and handing it over to Neo4j. I'm doing zero transformation. So yeah, I did stage the data in a way that I could just pass it through. But you know, BigQuery, you could run a SQL query, do a lot of transformation of the data without having to move it out, and then just move it natively from end to end. And then the beauty is we can do this in parallel as well. So as we're importing the data into the graph, we can just stream multiple streams of these vectors directly to Neo4j. And we know that they can each come with a schema and we can say, okay, this one's a node, this one's an edge. How do we represent this? Uh, how do we build the graph back together? And then the, really the nicest thing is if you look at the code, all we're using is PyArrow, which is the Apache Arrow Python wrapper in the BigQuery client from Google. There's no other weird third-party dependencies. I don't know, maybe what they pull in, I don't know. Um, but it's pretty simplistic, and it is just pure Python, at least in what I implemented. Um, and there also wasn't any multiple servers involved. I literally, we had one Jupyter kernel server and the Neo4j VM, both in the same region, which, thank the demo gods, the outage that GCP had this morning didn't impact our demo. <laughs> Um, and this is ultimately what the architecture looks like for the Python code in these yellow uh, nodes, you could say. So you've got the kernel process that is executing the notebook cells. For stability reasons, I found um, it was better to create a sub-process and let that drive the actual workers. Uh, the thing not in the diagram is the BigQuery client basically lets you say, okay, give me these, this table from the data set. Um, and what it'll give you back is a stream of stream names. And then you take those stream names, you take the BigQuery client, you say, okay, stream this part of the stream. And so that allows you to do the parallelization. So this guy here is basically taking um, all the names of all the stream segments and it's using Python's multiprocessing module spinning up a worker pool, and then just divvying out work, saying, okay, here's your stream, here's your stream, here's your stream. And then they all use the BigQuery client to go grab um, the arrow vectors and then just pump them to the target Neo4j system. Nice and easy. Um, so this is predominantly one Python file, and then the one, the client that speaks arrow to GDS is in another. Because we have a protocol where you have to first Tell Neo4j, hey, I'm about to blast you with data so it knows what's going on. Um, and then you can do things like give the graph a name, which is nice. And then you send the nodes. You say, I'm done loading the nodes because it has no concept of how big the data set is. Then you do it with the edges, and you're done. And you can adapt this pretty easily to an environment in Spark. Um, there's some caveats I've found working in Spark with this. So if you are interested in doing this, I mean, we do have a Spark connector that we offer for Neo4j that uses the Java driver. It's pretty intelligent to the point where it will do things like create indexes for you in the database. And so if your job is to build a database, it's a good option right now. But if your job is to build the analytics in memory graph with GDS, you could just reach for the new arrow capabilities in GDS 2.1. Um, the catch is Spark is very row oriented, which is kind of annoying. Um, and Spark, I feel like every Spark environment is always lagging behind in the cool features that would make everything easier. So they have some newer upcoming stuff where I think they're extending the Pandas data frame API they implement that might, I haven't tested it yet, but should let you take a data frame at the Spark worker, which is the important part. So it has a subset of the data from the data set or the data source and pass that data frame object or something that looks like a data frame to PyArrow that'll create the arrow table that you can then just ship over the wire. Um, instead, what we have right now, I've got a, a mock-up uh, project that loads some fake um, credit card processing fraud data. 
you know, we, you can use the BigQuery Spark connector, which if you're running a data proc, it's already installed and available. Uh, target a table, so that's the project name, the data set name, and then the table. And I'm doing a little bit of transformation because you know, I had some GUID field that needed to be adapted to the node ID. Um, and then the real magic was in this load roses tables. And we just basically mapped that arrow job over all the Spark partitions, so to truly parallelize this. So depending on the data load and how it ends up partitioned out, you're going to end up with numerous Spark workers spraying data at a target Neo4j system. Um, and if you're more into the Apache Beam realm of things, you can do the same exact thing, but with Beam pipelines and Beam workers. And so this is the output from doing a very, very large scale test, so much larger than what we did this morning. And it was uh, backed not by BigQuery, but by Parquet files. So in this case, we had hundreds of Parquet files in Google Cloud Storage representing nodes, and tens of thousands, I don't know why we ended up with 50,001 um, edges in Parquet files as well. Each of them had assigned some random data properties. This was all synthetic data generated uh, using the Graph 500 um, data set. And this was pretty, pretty large, and we were talking multiple terabytes of data that we needed to load. And end to end, it only took us three and a half hours. Um, with a good chunk of that time, because if you look at that, this is the CPU utilization on the Neo4j target. Um, there are, there's measurable time in between these stages for Apache Beam or Google Dataflow orchestration tasks, because it first has to spin up the worker pool before it starts shipping the work to the workers, and then it spins them all down and that we could probably shave some time off just getting that synchronization stuff worked out. So this is purely for create stuff, okay? Did you guys do, for, you guys do any tests for updates? Uh, no, not yet. Yeah, we're working on update capability. So this is starting from scratch and just bootstrapping the whole graph. And so what this looks like in a beam pipeline, and I redacted the name of the bucket we were pulling from. Um, it's pretty simple. I mean, this one is very similar to the, the keynote demo. I mean, it's literally, OK, we're going to read the Parquet files. Beam has native support for that. So pointed at the bucket source, it's going to discover all the Parquet files. We're going to get the, you know, the reference to all of those in our P collection. Um, yeah, ingesting nodes. Send table was the implementation with the arrow client. So all it's doing is taking the Parquet file reference using pi arrow to turn it into a um, pi arrow table, and then blasting it to Neo4j. And then this last step was really just to write out some stats. So it was really this two steps, read the data, spray the data. Super simple. If you want, you know, you could do transformations in here and advance and all these things. But if you're working with something like Parquet that you can just natively flip into a pi arrow table, it's quite fantastic. Makes it nice and easy. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, we showed the keynote demo this morning. GDS 2.1 is due out any moment now. Um, I don't know the exact release date. <laughs> Thursday? Next week? This week? OK. Yeah, full disclaimer about, you know, no guarantees about releases, all these things, yada, yada, yada. Safe harbor. Um, but the release candidate has been available. We were, when we were building the demo, it was built on um, some of the pre-release private alpha drops. And then the demo today used the release candidate as publicly available. Um, and so the future of way, the way Apache Arrow is going to start working with Neo4j it looks pretty promising. So we got GDS 2.1 coming out this week. And uh, one of the things I didn't really talk about is under the covers, our graph data science client, which if you're not aware is effectively kind of like a more of a data science oriented wrapper around the Python driver to allow you to interact with Neo4j, run graph algorithms without having to submit or manu I should say manually create cipher statements to submit to call stored procedures to run algorithms. Instead, you interact with the graph as if it's a Python object, 
which is really nice. So the data scientist doesn't have to learn all the nuances of the cipher syntax, and they can just play with it. And plus, it has the ability to take results and turn them into data frames for you. But now the nice thing is, if you have PyArrow uh, installed in your uh, Python environment when you're running it, it will be able to detect that. If it's on the server as well, on the Neo4j server side, it'll then be able to use Arrow as the transport layer instead of Bolt under the covers. And so if you have that use case that I had last year, I need to move 100 million feature vectors quickly, it'll be able to do that. You know, I talked mostly about ingestion in this talk, but it works in reverse as well, which is really the beauty of it. Um, and then Q3, uh, in one of the other rooms, Luke Gannon, one of the product managers for ORDS, is talking about our managed service offering for graph data science. And he gave me permission to put a Q3 potential delivery date for Aero support within Aura DS as well. So in the ideal world that we're envisioning, you know, you can have an analytics or data science team that's entirely cloud oriented, you know, folks that don't manage their own infrastructure, they just choose managed services, they work in the cloud natively from day in and day out, whether it's stuff in storage buckets or BigQuery or Redshift or whatnot or Snowflake. And then, you know, even their analytics environment, their kernels from Jupyter are all managed somewhere else. Why not tap into the, that on the graph data science side as well? But the goal remains really to be completely under the covers. So this is a kind of a question I've got a lot because in reality, you shouldn't know Arrow exists. Uh, chances are you're already using it today because if you use something like Spark, um, even if you use Pandas, Pandas now is starting to use Arrow under the covers um, as an optional way to, I think, serialize some data. And so you're probably already a consumer of Apache Arrow and just don't know it. And so that's really the goal is that a year from now, I won't be giving a talk on Apache Arrow, but hopefully the consequence of the integration under the covers, which is really what I'm hoping for. So that was basically the, what I wanted to cover and I wanted to leave enough time for questions. So thank you all for coming at the end of the day. <laughs>